Science is a methodology that may or may not immediately heal truth. So you can approach the truth, but you never know it. It's better to think of science as a process. Hi, hey, humans! Welcome to Demystifying Science, only show on Earth, filmed off Earth. Remember to give us a like and subscribe to keep these conversations bubbling. Today, we spoke with a marine biologist, Dr. Milton Love, from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Milton has spent most of his life involved with the sea. He grew up on the beach in Santa Monica, worked as a commercial fisherman, and then started his research career in marine biology at UCSB, where he's still a professor today. During the conversation, he afforded us a wide perspective on the state of the Earth's oceans, and offered ways in which the scientific opinion has changed over time. We even managed to get him to speculate wildly on questions of animal communication, the Earth as a living organism, and ways for his lab to raise enough money to rent a two-person submarine research vessel that costs nearly $20,000 a day. His humor and good cheer have made him an ever-present face in the marine biology community for several decades. And his unique perspectives have been memorialized in films, TV, and magazines, including a special on coral reefs for the Cousteau Society, and one on underwater mountains for PBS. In addition to authoring at least five books on his local coastal marine fauna, he's published widely in his field and has contributed to numerous popular magazines like New Scientist, Dolphin Log, and Scuba Times. I love Dolphin Log! Our conversation ranged from the role of observation versus theory in science, to how to be comfortable with uncertainty, and how expertise requires constant revision. My favorite part of the interview is how funny the guy is. I absolutely lost it a couple times. His deep love for his research subjects, the marine life of the California coast, comes through so clearly. At the end, he wraps it up really succinctly. A sustainable human future requires deep, abiding respect for the oceans. Nature has an unlimited number of ways to end you, or any life form. So watch out, humans, and enjoy the conversation. Like, subscribe, and share the conversation. It'll make sure we have more guests lined up in the future. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Hey, uh, but before we start, um, a little bit of housekeeping. Just first of all, thank you for um, paying me the ten thousand dollars to to do this. Well, money uh, is meaningless in space, so we can just print it. Uh, easy come, easy go. I'm sure that's what the, certainly the federal government just prints it. Um, the check has not has not arrived, hmm. and uh, I. I know the Postal Service is having difficulties, uh, which, which will be cleared up after the election mysteriously. Don't know how that is. But I want to make sure you put enough postage on the, on the letter. Just, just checking in with you here. Can we send goats instead? I hear that some cultures use those as currency instead. Fish? Goats are fine. Excellent. Those would be lovely. Um, I don't know how to translate ten thousand dollars into goat but I'm, I'm sure you guys can work it out we'll send a surplus how much rockfish do you get for ten thousand dollars on earth that's a great question so when i was a commercial fisherman back in 1969 we got three cents a pound uh -oh. for most rockfish but the bright red ones we got 12 cents a pound because Asian buyers like to buy whole red fish, so they were worth more. Fortunately for you guys, fish is no longer cheap protein. And so let's assume about six bucks a pound. So there you go. Wow. Yeah. So that seems like things have changed on Earth pretty significantly in the oceans since you were a commercial fisherman in 1969. You've been yes, watching... Indeed the ocean for your whole life, huh? Oh, yeah, my, uh, uh, let's see, in 1952, my parents 
uh, moved us from uh, central LA area to the beach at Santa Monica. And that kind of started it. I was, uh, my dad took me fishing on the Malibu Pier when I was six. And that's when I, shortly after, according to family lore, announced I was going to be a, a marine biologist. So yeah, from that time. So what are the biggest changes that you've seen in your lifetime to the oceans that you've known all of this, all these years? Well, in a way, it's, it's kind of hard to, um, to generalize because some things have changed, some things have not changed. Some things have changed in one direction and kind of come back. Uh, I mean, it's easy to say, well, everything's overfished, for instance. Is that the and case? Yeah, that's the thing. It depends on what part of the world you're in and what fishes you're looking at. And in general, yes, that is the case. But in specifics, if you go into look at Southern California and you look at the rockfish populations, big commercial species, many species, some of them are actually up and relatively healthy, literally from the late 90s when they were declared overfished. And now they're um, off the Overfish list. On the other hand, plenty of fishes worldwide, for instance, sharks that are um, in in terrible shape. So um, it, it, it depends if you're a half full person or the glass is half empty. And uh, uh, it, personally, I um, I have to um, uh, fend off um, despair on a daily basis. So I tend to be the half empty person. Do you think that uh, at, some species have benefited from others disappearing? Well, that's a hypothesis anyway, <clears throat> and, and one that was uh, uh, very popular in, um, in the Sailor Sea in Puget Sound about 10 years ago when everything was overfished. And then uh, ling cod came back. Ling cod are a major predator on rockfishes, for instance. And so the ling cod population started to come back but the rockfish population did not. And the theory was that the lingcod booming population were keeping down the rockfish. But um, that's just a hard one to know. Marine science is a very, very hard uh, field. It's not, and no put down of people who repair transmissions and the like, but uh, someone brings a transmission in and uh, generally you know how to fix it. And at the end of the day, you fix it and you, you go home and you go like, well, I repaired the transmission. Marine science tends to be much more complicated. Studies can last decades, really. And on a daily basis, you don't know what's going on. And even at the end of the study, you're not sure what's going on because there's so much variability and so many interactions that you're dealing with that it's, uh, it's hard to answer what sound like Good, but simple questions. There you go. Well, it's interesting because it seems like in the popular media on Earth, there's a lot of certainty about what marine biologists are saying about the oceans. Do you get that feeling? Sure. And, but, but you, can, you, can, um, more, you can globalize that, that in, in popular media, things that are gray don't read well and are not terribly popular. And in fact, you can extrapolate that to humans in general. I don't think humans deal with gray very well. I don't, and that may be if you take a purely genetic standpoint to, to many things, and maybe I do that too far, it may be that we're not built for grays, that we're built, we're not built for nuances. Can you build we're yourselves built for, for nuances in the future? Life. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Can you build yourselves in the future for those gray areas? I don't know. Uh, right now, though, politicians who are nuanced and sophisticated, they lose. They tend to lose. People don't like that. They're not comfortable with that. Philosophies that are uh, gray, uh, they lose in, in the great competitions. That's the reason that Religion, I think, this is purely my own view, that religion worldwide, uh, the most successful ones are the ones that give you answers, not the ones that go like, well, we don't know, right? 
And so when coming back to your original question about, about the news media and marine science or science in general, um, the news media and news media is like people, they're not like robots. People are attracted to what they perceive as answers. Dude. Even if the studies that they're reporting on may not give quite as firm an answer as the, the media reports. That's the reason, by the way, that scientists generally, I think, make terrible witnesses in trials, is that it's very hard to pin a scientist down to say, absolutely, this is what happened. We are trained to, to make it more nuanced and to say, well, the probabilities are this, or the probabilities are that, or our studies imply this. It's not very satisfying. And, um, Possibility. The way the research works. Yeah, it seems giving... like there's a greater emphasis on possibility rather than certainty in much of research. Yeah, and I remember having a discussion with somebody recently about nutrition and how you read that uh, uh, vitamin A is, is great because there was a, a study in Great Britain that showed that people with uh, whatever it was, higher lung cancer rates have lower vitamin A. All right, so then everybody is packing in the vitamin A. And then it turns out that that's probably not the case. It may be the opposite. And it's not the vitamin A, but, uh, but some side of uh, carotenes that are, are actually the thing that are important. And, and because you get these conflicting studies that scientists can, can often handle in the sense that we're aware that science evolves, um, the public uh, it may not be comfortable with the idea that a study that shows one thing one time, it may not be the, the be all and end all. This seems like it might be very common in something that's an observational science, like marine biology requires you to go into the wild and to look at what's happening in the ocean in these very inaccessible places. But much of science that's really well funded on Earth seems to be focused on model systems and model organisms. Right. What? And, and um, to be completely honest, I am 73 years old and I have been arguably in the marine science end of things since I was, let's just say, 25. So that's rounded off a half century. And until about um, three years ago, I never uh, did a study that had a hypothesis ever. It was all observational. Hey, there's oil platforms off California. I wonder how they're serving as fish habitat. Not even any hypothesis. Just like let's. It was like it was like the old Andy Hardy movies from the 30s, where Andy and his friends decided let's have a, uh, a musical performance in the barn, and by golly, there was Judy Garland and. Uh, it was like, hey, let's go and uh, see if we can scam $300,000 and we'll go take a submarine and count fishes around platforms. Did so, you find Judy Garland? Uh, just the rem her, her bones, but not... <laughs> oh, I wondered what happened with her. Not her. I know. Um, uh, I was going to publish that, but uh, Calmer had said, just don't get involved. And mm -hmm. I think that was a wise move. Mm -hmm. So... Um, until, like I say, we, we actually did an experiment, uh, uh, I, 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 it was all observational. And, and I think you're correct. If you work on model systems, if you work on Drosophila and, and you work on genetics of Drosophila, then it, it is clear. And you will, and I think, though I'm not an expert, I think you will get results that are more reproducible, that take less time to do. I remember my major professor at UCSB, who is a field ecologist and would spend two years looking at fishes at some reef. The department chairman, who is a molecular biologist, told him that if he couldn't publish three or four papers a month, then he didn't belong at the university because wow. this guy was working with Petri dishes, right? like petri dishes and a bunch of bacteria. And by golly, you can crank a lot of papers out. So there was a, uh, a disconnect in his understanding of what science uh, was about. Yeah. 
So your approach is much more natural philosopher, almost. This is something that doesn't really seem to appear a lot in the modern sciences. Yeah, and, and I described this in an in a autobiographical essay that I was requested that I write, that it's much better to think of me as a, uh, a vicar in uh, 18th century or 19th century England who gave a... a, a um, a homily on Sundays, and the rest of the time uh, studied uh, spiders in his backyard. And man, that person knew a lot about spiders at the end of 50 years. And, and it's much better to think about me as, uh, as you say, a natural historian, natural philosopher, who just goes out and, and finds stuff out. And this is part and parcel of the evolution that I had where I started out as a fisherman and started out just being interested in fish from that point of view. And uh, that evolved into just a general interest in, in stuff in the ocean. And um, somehow I pulled that scam off for my entire career, it's, unusually. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. But you must be drawing your own conclusions off of what you see. In the sense yeah, of, sure. you know, you're cataloging and you're putting together these massive guides to the fish that are on the Pacific coast. You have a widespread... You must have hatched some theories along the way. Then maybe you didn't oh, publish. Oh, yeah, and I, and I discarded them. I remember <laughs> uh, after a couple of years of doing um, surveys of the fishes around platforms off here, I kind of thought that, well... Um, yeah, there are a lot of fish, a lot of fish around these platforms. Densities there tend to be higher around these platforms of certain fish than even of natural reefs. And I, but I still thought, well, there aren't that many platforms. They're not very big. So probably the contribution of fishes at the platforms to the population as a whole, the, probably the contribution was not very large. And I remember I, I gave a seminar in, uh, in Alaska, in, in Juneau, when I said that, and this was after like three years, but by 10 years, uh, it, my, my, my thought processes had become a lot more nuanced. You go out there and you see 300,000 young boccaccio, which is a, an economically important fish, 300,000 at a platform. And at that point you're going like, shoot, I wonder if this, these really are important structures if they are producing significant numbers of fish. And I did a study with um, Alec McCall, who was at the National Marine Fisheries Service. He was the stock assessment person for Boccaccio. His job was to figure out how many of them are there on the Pacific coast. So I just handed him that data. Oh, well, we got six platforms and 430,000 baby Boccaccio. Is that significant? And it turned out it really was. It was uh, a major amount, a percentage of all the baby Boccaccio on the entire Pacific coast. They would turn into uh, a significant number of adults. And that's when my, to your point, my, my ideas had to shift. The hardest thing, I think, well, for me, but I think for many scientists, the hardest thing is what, you've, what you have uh, addressed, and that is, you go in and you've got an idea, a hypothesis, if you will, and then the data doesn't match that. And it's really hard to give it up because you love your hypothesis. It was like the little kid. And to have to drop kick the kid out of the house just because the data doesn't show it is really, really hard. Scientists are human beings first. And um, in general, we don't, we like structure, we like predictability, and, and we like and we think we're right, not just in science, but in politics or philosophy or religion. And, and most of us don't do well with countervailing evidence. So yeah, on several occasions, I've, I've thought of things. The other thing, of course, is that you sit in, you, in your office and you go like, all right, let's do this experiment. I remember we did an experiment to try to answer the question, if you've got a submarine power cable and it's live, right? And it's emitting uh, an electromagnetic field and there are marine animals that can detect the earth's magnetic field and they use it for migrations and so forth. So the question is, 
if a crab is walking along and it comes up to a, a, a power cable and it detects that field, what happens? Does it just sit there and fry its brains out or runs away? What happens? So uh, we set up an experiment in the lab uh, using a uh, mailing tube to imitate the cable and uh, I think uh, two pine cones and a uh, roll of toilet paper, I think. And uh, it was fabulous on the floor. But then <laughs> you get out in the ocean and not so much. Uh, so there's a lot of, even something as trivial as, all right, let's try this experiment. The, the weather screws you up, the condition screws you up, the animals screw you up. It's a very, humbling experience at least for me i don't know about i i'm i mean uh, if you're sufficiently narcissistic maybe it's not a humbling experience because you ignore it but in my case uh the ocean is a very humbling place for humans i want to go back to something you said earlier about religion actually i know you're not a religious expert but you said something really interesting to me which was People tend to go for religions that, what did you say? They, that have answers. They have answers, that's it. Does yeah. science constitute a religion on Earth? Since it has so many yeah. answers? It can. And, and some people, I think, use science as a religion. As, and and it, I think it all comes back. You have to, or I, this is just my ideas, right? Right. So my concept is that one of the reasons religion evolved was to give the veneer of control to human beings. We live in a, a universe that I consider not hostile, but neutral. So bad things happen all the time, particularly if you lived in a fucking cave. Right. Bad things. Saber tooth tiger comes and eats your ch children. For sure. So one of the things humans like to, to be able to feel is that they're in control and religions that give uh, a, a lot of answers, it gives you a sense of control, particularly those religions where you give over yourself to that religion or to that philosophy, because then you, it, it's out of your hands that there's a higher being that is that. Um, uh, has given you some some framework for destiny. So, uh, and that's not everybody, by the way, and that's not even all religious people. There are um, a lot of religions, I think, smaller ones in terms of population, that that are more nuanced and and do give humans a sense of, uh, well, I have to control my own dense destiny or, or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Are That's there a popular view, but sure. Are there versions of science that tend more towards the latter? So it seems like if there's an academic structure, it's more of a priest role in the religion of science. Is there a way for normal people to participate in science? Or to at least increase the amount of gray space where there isn't this definitive yes or no answer. Because it seems like on Earth there's this terrible crisis of science denialism, and much of it seems to come from the fact that there is this tendency to report scientists as having the answers. And then well, people are shocked when they don't have the answers. Or when they try to change their minds. So then the, the question is, have you answered your own question at the very end there, that the way science is perceived and reported and taught, uh, maybe it, that's done incorrectly, and that it, it's better to think of science as a process, as opposed to an end of its, to it in, an, in and of itself. And that if people were aware that, that science is, is a uh, is 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 a, a methodology that may or may not yield immediately truth, and in, of course, as a scientist, I've had that beaten out of me that 
we would never know the truth. You can approach the truth, but you never know it. It just becomes a statistical um, parameter. So if, if, if average people who are not scientists, who do other things in their lives, could, could understand that, then it might make things uh, uh, easier. Denialism, that's a universality. Hmm. And uh, all humans, uh, I shouldn't say that, many humans deny all kinds of things. And they can be scientists or non-scientists. And part of denialism, I think, has to do with discomfort. You had a lot and of people who denied your findings about the oil platforms, didn't you? Yeah. So that's a good, that's a nice example. So the first time I, I, I it's actually in a way not, I'm trying to think how people respond to, to my research. So my research shows that many, if not all platforms off California are uh, harbor large uh, densities of fishes, um, sometimes not all year round, but on average, and that um, a lot of reefs do not harbor high densities of these same fishes. And I remember I gave a talk to a group of environmentalists two years into my research in 1997. And I'm, you know, I walk that side of the street, man. I, I walk the left wing environmental side of the street. So those, those were kind of my peeps. And I remember at the end of my talk, I said, um, let's forget about the fish for a moment. Uh, th th these platforms are covered in marine life. There are hundreds of millions on a typical platform, hundreds of millions of organisms, sea stars and mussels and crabs and crustaceans of various sorts. These are and oil platforms, you know, just for the yeah, listeners. How, what was the question? Oh, can you just clarify uh, the platforms? They're former oil platforms for drilling? They're current, current okay. oil and gas platforms. Thanks. And off California, there are 27. Um, which is not very many in the Gulf of Mexico. There are thousands of them and they're in Australia. They're all over the world and uh, they're large steel structures. Some of them are uh, 80 or 100 feet on the side. Some are, are bigger. So they're substantial and they cover the entire water column. And off Col California, they're covered in marine life and uh, that have settled down as larvae and, and have grown up there. So they're covered in all kinds of organisms. And, I, I, and, and what happens when a platform is uneconomical to operate is that generally the platforms are removed. They're blown up mostly. Huh. Sometimes in the Gulf of Mexico, they are tipped over on their sides or they're moved someplace else to act as reefs, but generally they're removed. So I, I said at this meeting in 97, I said, hey, um, just to you know, inform you when you, when you remove a platform, you kill all these animals. And I didn't say that was bad or good. And I remember a, a person raised their hand and said, I don't care how many millions of animals die. I want those platforms out of there. Wow. Now, I'd never heard that before. And since then, I've, I've heard that often. And, and so that is not denialism. That's just a different philosophy. And, and that philosophy can be I don't like anything artificial in the ocean. The ocean just should, ha should have natural stuff in it. And the, I'm happy to have that trade-off. A lot of animals die, but at least we get all that steel out of there. Or it can be, uh, I hate the oil industry. Why should we reward the oil industry by letting them keep part of their platform in, in, in the ocean, right? So um, that's really not denialism, but it is interesting, isn't it? Because it comes from a deeply held, emotionally laden, philosophical uh, um, paradigm, structure. Belief. And it's not right or wrong. I mean, it's not like you can address that from science. It's just a deeply held view. And, and my job, after 20 years of this, this kind of research, is not to tell people what is right or wrong about platforms or what you should do with them. My job is just to tell people the facts. 
And people being people, they can uh, reject the facts, they can accept them, but still reject the, the, uh, the, uh, re reject the information, uh, or they can accept it, right? And I've always tried to be very clear that um, this was paid for by the taxpayers, so all taxpayers get the same uh, information. I've had very few people who were denialists who just said, you're lying. Uh, there is one um, person in Santa Barbara who has, has said that quite often and who said, basically, I'm, I'm uh, a stoolie of the, the oil industry, because which is you fine. I mean, that's, this person's job is to uh, undercut my credentials, and, and that's that's fine. The rationale uh, for that was that you were partially funded by oil industry, or it was just right. And so often it seems to be the case, right, where a lot of conflicts of interest result in denying results of various inquiry. Yes, and, and sometimes those are those historically. Uh, if you look at the uh, smoking research funded by the tobacco industry, um, you can argue that that was not very good research. In, in my case, um, the oil money I've gotten has been a, a tiny, I can't remember, like 8% of all the funding, almost all the funding has come from the federal government, but there, there is 8%, and it actually was laundered oil money. It went into a, <laughs> an NGO, and then the NGO gave it to me, but it was, it was from Chevron. Uh, but all the research we do, almost all of it, uh, is videotaped. You're going along in a submarine and you're counting fish and, and what I see through the porthole is what the camera sees. So I always say, you know, if you don't believe our numbers, you can come in and I'll hand you a beer and you can spend the next six months counting the fish yourself if you don't, you know, believe me. So um, I imagine was, not many people have taken you up on that offer. No. And uh, um, that's probably a good thing because I really wouldn't buy them that good a beer anyway. So nobody would have a very good time. I've never had anybody take me up yeah. on the offer, but the offer stands. <laughs> we have a lot of videotape on, on DVDs and actually it's now on external hard drives. Um, Maybe if you offered a ride in the submarine, you could sweeten the deal. Oh, if we could have that submarine again. Oh, that was the highlight of our not in the royal hour, but everybody in my labs uh, year, it was... Uh, Did it sink? Uh, it, was, it was the size of a... We didn't own it. We rented it. It was the size of a phone booth. And there was a pilot and then one observer. And uh, it was painted bright yellow. The Delta, it was called. And man, that was so much fun. Because going underwater, going underwater in scuba depth is one thing, but you get below 100 feet and you're in places where people have never been in some cases. And, wow. you know, we could go down to, I guess, 1,200 feet of water. And there are some places where you're going like, this is like I'm smoking crack, man. This is like <laughs> in fucking credible. And you come back and you can barely talk. Even after having done it 50, 80, 100 times, there were still times when all of us in the lab would come back and, and you're just going like, that was an experience. So. Man, I'd love to give people a ride in that sub, but the <laughs> the sub is not available anymore. So, oh, it was so. Who's got it now? I think it's like a flower pot now. <laughs> the guy, the guy who owned it, uh, just I don't, you know, we I don't think we have to go into any detail, but it it became unusable, and. Um, there are other manned submersibles in the world, but they're very, ex they're like really expensive. And even toward the end, this one was with the research vessel, it was like 20,000 a day. So wow. that, that was starting Whoa. to get up there with the big kids, man. And um, if it, yeah, yeah, that was too bad. What are those costs from? Just maintenance? Uh, Research vessels themselves are expensive. Even cheap ones are 10K a day. A, a, a really nice one is 20 or 30K a day. So you got to like drive the ship or you drive the sub out there on a ship 
and then plunk it down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. And then you, you drop it. And, and the sub has two or three rotating pilots, and they have upkeep, and you got to – these people have kids with braces, so you got to pay them a decent salary. And it just all adds up to a ton of money. Wow. But it was a good – 12 or 14 years. And there's no eccentric billionaire that you can find that's interested in funding this sort of thing? If you know of one, just uh, send me uh, any information you've got because uh, uh, I'll give them a ride too. No, no eccentric billionaires. Uh, academics rarely hang with eccentric billionaires. I, having said that though, having said that, I'm in Santa Barbara right now and Eight miles, I computed, in a straight line, uh, Harry and Megan have just moved here. And uh, uh, they have pretty good bucks. You know, the royal family is pretty well set up. So maybe I should approach them. They might be interested. No. Yeah. If you could pitch it as uh, homeschooling for their royal grubs. Archie. For Archie, I'll give Archie a drop. There you go. Archie you go. can come out and... and uh, and study rockfish with me. Oh, you could set up this, a day this, camp. I should. Uh, Elon Musk has got some little ones coming up too. It seems like. Yeah, I don't know what the kid's name is though. I Are mean, you writing this down right now? You should write this down. Yeah, I'm writing these. These ideas are like gold. Hold on. Can't, we get that uh, a lot. Uh, so it's like day camp for royalty or for uh, Elon Musk's uh, kid. American royalty. Who, who is like nameless, American royalty. We do actually have a class system here in spite of what we think. And if you could capitalize on that, it would be really interesting to even look at the research that you're doing from the lens of what humans can learn from these ecosystems that are so distant from us. Well, they certainly are, and, and I mean, it's trite to say, but uh, most of the ocean no one's gone to, and so it's, there's places on Mars that are, are much more well-known than some huge percentage of the ocean, so uh, yeah, you're dealing with very complex, not unknowable systems, but systems that are very hard to access and very hard to study for many reasons and, uh, and are extremely complex. But they have a lot one to thing, teach you humans, right? Well, they do. And, and one thing, it's almost a truism, and maybe it's not true, but I tend to believe it, that field ecologists tend to be the most politically progressive I'll rephrase that. A lot of field ecologists are progressive people. What's that mean? Experience. That means uh, that they, they, they see nuances. They see the interrelationships of all living things. They often want to protect these things. They are not so self-involved that they're only out for themselves. And the question, I actually wrote an essay, a little essay one time for new scientists. There was a period in the early 80s when I wrote for Natural History Magazine and New Scientist until the editor at Natural History said, oh, we laugh like crazy, but we, we can't publish this. So anyway, um, uh, and I wrote one about different political persuasions of different scientists. And it was almost... Uh, I don't even know if this is true, but there was a sense that geologists, for instance, tended to be quite conservative politically. And molecular biologists, that, and this has been my experience, tended to be a bit more politically conservative and that field ecologists tend to be liberals or progressive. Hmm. Is that because they're on different sides of industry? Like the no, geologists are often so, revolving with the petro industry and so, the ecologists well, is, are perhaps that, pushing back? That, that part is, I think there's some truth there. I don't know how much, but there is truth. The question, let's assume for a moment it's true. And I don't know if it's true. So then the question is, do people 
who have these political leanings tend to go into these fields or does the field help shape your political views or, or, or social views? Uh, maybe political isn't good, but social views. And the, w- the reason we got into this, into this riff was, th- so the question is, I- I- if you study the ocean, let's say, and you're down there amongst all the animals and you're starting to feel something for these systems, does it make you more likely to want to take care of them, to be interested in how if you alter one part of the system, you're uh, disfiguring, that's a loaded term, you're altering uh, another part. I, I actually don't know. I, I mean, it would be unfair to me to, to just state baldly, you know, anything about that. But that's always been my sense is that you want to take care of that which you appreciate. That makes sense. It seems like it's probably some sort of a feedback loop involving both sides of that argument where you're recruiting people to an industry or to a line of study and then also reinforcing ideas. Well, I have a yeah, for better or worse. I have a question that's a little bit in a different direction but derives from whether or not people care about these systems. Do you think that it's fair to look at something like a forest or an ocean as a kind of super organism? Well, certainly that's been bandied about, right? The Has whole, it? Yeah, the whole Gaia hypothesis of the Earth. I mean, it's been a long time since I read all this stuff, but the Earth as as a, a kind of a living organism. So. Um, it's certainly been thought about a lot, and uh, and I'm smart enough to know that I have no idea. I mean, it, even though I have a PhD, which is a license to pretend you know everything. Yeah, uh, can't you just wildly speculate at this point? Yeah, that's all it would be. Be like some fucking wild speculation. <laughs> Go for it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Know. From what you've seen, you've been down there in these places where no one goes. You've seen these things that no one sees. What it, do you get the sense that things are moving and acting together and feeding off of one another, or sure. that it's just absolutely? Well, uh, I mean, th- there's no question. And we're talking not only about uh, living things, but we're talking about carbon dioxide being absorbed in the ocean and and uh, uh, the thermodynamics of the ocean, things are warming and currents are changing and all that stuff. Yeah, there's, there's no question. I'm, I'm just leery of attaching uh, an idea about something living. It seems like humans are approaching this bizarre new phase in your development where things on one side of the planet are affecting the other side of the planet really fast. Is there precedent for that in nature on earth in the oceans global communication well, cut. well i'm just thinking about in the oceans it in a way or uh, the first thing i flashed on were certain birds that uh migrate from for instance uh south america to the uh north american arctic well okay there is a, a linkage uh, from around the world of organisms, uh, regular ones, and you're transmitting nutrients, and you're transmitting potentially pathogens and all kinds of stuff. And in the ocean, there are long-term migrations. I remember there was this classic one, I don't know if it's a migration, that, that a uh, white shark was tagged off of South Africa and uh, the, 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 the fish was uh, detected off Australia. And it just, and that was like third of the way around the, around the earth. So uh, there are organisms that are moving uh, a lot, whether it's from one side of the earth to another, there may not be a lot of that, but there's certainly a lot of movement uh, trans-Pacific and in just looking at the, the ocean here and north and south and yeah, so there's... What about of- synchron? I, I heard about this synchronous spawning of corals all around the globe. What about that kind of thing? 
Yeah. Yeah. What about that kind of thing? I mean, yeah. <laughs> is that? It was a, what, a, you don't necessarily have the expertise to speak to that, but what do you, what is your immediate reaction when you read something like that? What goes through your mind after everything that, that you've uh, seen? Natural selection is an amazing thing. Th th that's my fallback on virtually any kind of interesting behavior an organism has or uh, color or appearance or, or whatever is, holy moly, if you give uh, uh, nature millions of years and a lot of selective pressure, you come up with all kinds of shit, holy moly. And so the example you gave of uh, synchronous spawning, even on a reef, forget it around, about the, around the world, but synchronous spawning of multiple species of anything uh, over a one or two night period, uh, gee, you know, that's, that's amazing. Or, or um, what is it, padarchy, which is um, a uh, marine worm that, whose uh, reproductive organs are in its rear end and, and uh, in a, a night or two in a season, all the rear ends will pop off the, the animal and come to the surface and then explode in sperm and, and eggs and, and it's all kind of synchronized. Well, like, uh, obviously there's been, to me, to me, obviously, there has been strong selective pressure for synchrony because if you're like three days off everybody else and your sperm all explodes, there's like no eggs and you, and that's driven out of the population really fast. Um, that's gnarly. So did the internet yeah. appear as the result of this kind of selective pressure? <laughs> that didn't take millions of years. I think it happened in the it, 90s. It didn't. Things are kind of, with humans, things are kind of sped up. Selective pressure acts, at least culturally, really, really fast. Yeah, what's up with really? Are by the humans way, evolving? This does this does bring up something, and then we can get back to humans evolving. You guys, you two guys, I use guys in a non-gender sense because I have, you know, I don't know, I don't know what you're naked, but we, I don't see any. We have six different story. sexes on our planet, so don't worry about so it. So guys is totally fine. Different strokes for different folks. I'm. I come from kind of a libertarian perspective. Whatever works for you, it's fine. But but thinking of cultural evolution, have you, I'm thinking that uh, you guys could be fabulous influencers. I'm just saying. I just want you to think about it. When you come down here, we can uh, maybe set you up in a house in uh, the Hollywood Hills, uh, parties. You could go shopping and and get some clothes. I'm throwing out ideas. Clothes? And get some clothes. Um, we could get you into USC. Turns out pretty easy to get you into USC. I don't know, did you do much athletics in the university back on Zarquan X or? Uh, We're from Alba Floss. Zarquan uh, X is next door. Okay. Alba. Alba Floss. Floss. Alba Floss. 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 Alva. Alva. Anyway, back home, uh, I just want to beef up your resume so we can get you into USC, though it turns out it's not necessary. So just want you to think about it. You're going to need an agent. We're going to monetize this thing. Just throwing ideas out. We figured that we would avoid the status games that humans play with each other by just our overwhelming charm and size. We'll just hang out in orbit and beam down occasionally to talk to you guys. Well, there's certainly, there's certainly charm, but I, there's no frame of reference. You guys could be 30 feet tall for all I know. There's no scale there. We'll bring a banana next time. Ah, oh, space bananas. Space bananas. We've been working on a, actually a horticulture pretty program. Good name, pretty good name for a rock group now that I'm focusing on it. One night only, space bananas at the rock group. Opening for Love Melt this. Banana. Yeah, there you go. So I can't even remember. Oh, evolution. Yeah. Are you guys evolving still? Is the internet the next phase of human evolution? Does Darwinism apply to humans? Is Darwin on the internet? Darwin's got is, to be on the is the Pope Catholic? Um, so, well, you're actually, I think, asking, in my mind, at least two different questions. One is, are humans evolving? That is, physically and physiologically. And the answer is probably yes. 
uh, I don't think we are, even with the rise of antibiotics and, and other things, I don't think that that process has ended, I think. Well, it but seems then like the about, antibiotics would actually be a mechanism of human evolution. Potentially. I mean, really, if you think about how selection works, it, it works at the reproductive level. So it doesn't matter if you're allowing someone to live to be 110 and, instead of um, 60, but that person has to have more kids than the uh, another person. Somehow genes have to be... Uh, passed on. So antibiotics may or may not be uh, working. It, it may work in a third world country where access to medicine is, isn't as good as in um, Canada, for instance, but, um, but there may be other physiological uh, pressures that are, that are um, acting as uh, uh, for selection. But the other question is one of cultural natural selection. And that seems clearly seems to be happening. If if you, I mean, it, things that are like that work give people pleasure for ill or good. Uh, that uh, make uh, money for ill or good. Those things are selected for, and uh, things that don't doesn't mean that they drop out of the quote unquote the cultural gene pool. It just means that they become uh, uh, less common. I mean, there are people who probably live in sod houses out on the prairie someplace. But that cultural norm kind of lost out to uh, indoor plumbing and uh, stucco. And uh, th there's probably a few retro people, but not very many. And, and by the same token, there are people who, who actually have a typewriter and mail letters to each other, I think. There may be, I don't know. Are there other and, animals that have culture? Uh, like do whales have culture? So, so what is what is culture? Oh, that's a good question. That's that I I don't actually know the answer, so I'm asking. I think we're talking uh, about behavioral transference that is not directly encoded in genes. Something like so that. So you you've kind of answered your question. There there certainly does seem to be that. If you're talking about organisms learning from observation, for instance, then corvids, crows, and jays, and ravens clearly do that. And, mm. and uh, people will make arguments even for octopuses doing that. And clearly, clearly there are mammals that, that do that. Um, primates do that. So, what about rockfish? Yeah. They live. I, you, you mentioned in one of your talks that we saw that they can live for hundred years. You had an orolith that was three hundred years. Two hundred and five is the oldest known individual rockfish. I'm sure they live longer, but and the way you can tell how old they are is uh, uh, you take the ear bones out of their ears and they lay down a ring a year, like a tree. Who figured this so out? You, you, you cut the ear bone in half and you heat it so that the rings pop out and then you look under a microscope and you count them. And um, 205 or 204, I can't remember, a rockfish taken off Alaska. And I'm sure that they're rockfish that live longer. That's some of the longest living animals on earth. So I think there's a, is it a sleeper shark, Greenland shark? that they think lives a, at least a couple centuries. I mean, there are other long-lived fishes, but rockfishes, by and large, live a long time. And there's so many uh, species of rockfish, right? Tonnage, man, tonnage. There's probably 70 species on the Pacific coast from, like, Mexico to Alaska. And What does a species mean in terms of rockfish? It's an inter of, well, interbreeding population that can produce sterile offspring. Yeah. Or? You can get into, you know, arguments. There's certain things that scientists seem to just adore arguing about. <laughs> so one of them is what is a species? People love to argue about that. The other one in my field is um, what is the what is the value of a marine protected area? People love to argue about that. Do marine protected areas work? 
Should we have them? How big should they be? Flah, 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 flah. Well, and I remember, go ahead. I'm not trying to argue with you. I just want to know what you mean when you say 20, 70 species. What is the species? Because oh, yeah. so, we've seen your pictures of those half and half fish. There's half and half fish. Are they a species? Oh, or? The infamous half and half fish. So, for our purposes, the kind of the operative definition of a species is uh, a group of organisms that are interfertile, and when they uh, either they can't mate with other species. Or if they do, the uh, hybrids are not as competitive hmm. as the adults. Okay, so people will disagree with that, but that's what does we're that using. mean? There could be multiple species of humans. If you could find spe uh, humans that do not reproduce well with each other as a whole, uh, then some people would argue that. Wow. So probably Neanderthal and humans and what's the new one? Denisovans? Denovians, right? Denovians were probably Denis interfertile to a certain extent, but maybe not completely interfertile. So, so the question is, why are there so many species of rockfish? And which is so few species of humans. And um, yeah, that's the other one. Got to love this stuff, right? Gotta love all this stuff, man. So I pick up a, a copy of Science Magazine. I, I just go like, well, first of all, I don't understand the titles of most of the papers, but the ones I do, I go like, wow, this is, this is cool stuff. I'm glad I'm doing this instead of preparing taxes for other people. Though I'm sure that's a lovely profession. Of and course. If you get off on that, A, more power to you. I imagine so, that preparing taxes for people often feels like doing crack cocaine. Oh, same as being undoubtedly. The accountants I know, holy moly, you've got to chain them to a chair because they're like sailing around the room. Wild, wild so, creatures. Um, so, but the question was that I think you're alluding to is like, well, why are there so many species of, of these closely related fish? And that's very unusual. The, the only really um, similar thing in a way are the um, cichlids, the little freshwater fish that live in the Rift Lakes of Africa, hmm. where in the same lake, you'll have dozens of species in the same lake. Wow. Holy moly. And, and they seem to be speciating like really, really fast. And so the question is, well, what is there about rockfishes that have allowed them to speciate very quickly? And in fact, uh, if you look at molecular clocks, and I don't even know if this is like real shit or not, but if you, there, there are scientists who, who figured they can figure out the rate of evolution of, of DNA. If you look at the DNA of rockfishes, there are species that have only been around for 20,000 years or so, which is like zip, right? In geologic time, like nothing. So, um, uh, which is the reason that I still have hope for the United States, because no matter how bad things are, how much longer can they be bad? Oh, like yeah. four, four more years, and that's nothing in geologic time. It's Even all if it's bad so for another 50 years. years. So it'll seem like an entire ice age, but there you go. So, uh, so the question is, well, what is it about rockfish that has led them to speciate so uh, dramatically? And uh, nobody knows. It seems like they're very hard to observe and to study. You, you said that nobody except for some scientists in Japan have ever even seen rockfish reproduce. That That's true? right, mating. As far as I know, I mean, there may be people who have seen it on the Pacific coast, but haven't said anything. But for whatever reason, the rockfishers, at least some of the rockfishers in Japan, uh, they mate during the daytime, I think. And uh, people have observed them and photographed them and, and like that. Off here, mating may take place at night. And there just aren't that many people underwater at night. It's just, it's just hard to... Uh, it's just hard to work at night underwater. It just is. So, so maybe they've just stayed out of the way and they've adopted a number of protected niches. And So the problem is that the, the classic uh, uh, mechanism for the creation of species, no pun intended, is that you have a population and it's 
split apart. It's separated by something, right? So you've got a river and it's got the species all through the river and there's a landslide and now you have two rivers or whatever. And then you have isolation of these two populations and they slowly evolve away from each other through selective pressure. And eventually, um, even if you brought them back together, they couldn't reproduce. But the problem is on the Pacific coast, it's very hard to see like, well, how does a population become isolated? We don't have landslides that cut all the way across California out 200 miles. So like, how's this happening? So do they eat the same stuff? My, I'm sorry. They eat the same food. The, the different species. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them do. Yeah. I mean, they, they the, many rock fishes are like generalists, like anything that comes by their mouths, they'll eat. Not, not completely, but yeah, there's a lot of overlap. Kind of so, like humans. They, they kind of do the same thing. They're a, a lot like humans so, in that. And they're a lot like humans and they have internal fertilization like humans. So fishes can have external fertilization, right? Sperm and eggs out in the water and then the larvae drift around. Or they can have internal fertilization and uh, rock fishes have. In, in fact, rock fishes are... Uh, like mammals, in a way, they're viviparous. They, they have internal fertilization. The larvae, the embryos form inside the female. And the female actually feeds the young, not through a placenta like we mammals, but actually produces little nutrient globules that, uh, that. embryos eat. So they, they're viviparous, but they're not placental viviparous like like us. So does the sheer amount of various rockfish species and the lack of obvious speciating mechanism cause you to think that there are other ways that species develop than the sort of classical Darwinist perspective? Oh yeah, and in fact that was the question given to me in uh... 1978 or 1977 for my PhD written exam. Oh, wow. My major professor. He, he, the question was, why are there so many species of rockfish? So, uh, yeah. It's, it's good to see you've made a lot of progress on that. <laughs> well, one of the things is that it's likely that uh, male rockfish produce a pheromone. They produce a chemical in their urinary bladders. And when the, they're ready to mate, this is my hypothesis. They actually swim by the nostrils of females and they emit this pheromone. Hmm. And uh, I think it's likely the pheromone is very specific to a species. So you can easily see how if you get slight differences in those pheromones, <clears throat> some females may respond to them and some females may not. And all of a sudden you're getting some kind of reproductive separation. So there may be that. The other thing, I was a little unfair to the state of California. The other thing is if you go back far enough in time to the ice ages, when sea level was a lot lower, there was probably uh, a lot less current flow. And there were probably, there were places that were uh, isolated, like the Channel Islands off here. Uh, instead of having four Channel Islands, or there was one, one really long one, which probably blocked current patterns. So. Other things may have happened, but your point is well taken. Like th there is no one easily digestible reason, which is, which is fabulous. That's the reason that we're in this business because we don't like easily digestible um, reasons for things. Mm -hmm. Well, I have one final line of inquiry and I'm curious First of all, if the oceans are in a dangerous state, who's managing that? I know you've been on both sides of the fence. You've been in the academy and you've been in the fishing industry. And I'm wondering who's best equipped to manage the oceans and who does it right now? Is there someone who's managing the oceans or is this a free-for-all type of thing. So if there is somebody, I don't know who they are. No phone number to call? 
one eight hundred oceans. I, I know you'd like it, and that would make a really interesting podcast. If you find out who is managing the oceans, uh, I I'd love to chat, or I'd, at least I'll watch the podcast um, uh, that that you have with that person. My guess is, ain't nobody managing the oceans. There are attempts to do that, particularly on uh, a species by species basis. So there's the International Whaling Commission, which in theory has some say over how much whaling is done and when. Uh, reality is that if a country wants to go out and kill whales, it goes like, we're gonna go out and kill whales. And then the commission goes bad. And then they go like, tough bananas, man. We're gonna go out and kill whales. So, or, or the, the um, bluefin tuna on, in the Atlantic, uh, arguably not doing well. There's a commission for that, uh, not very effective. I mean, so there are uh, organizations that uh, try to guide policy, not very effectively. It tends to be done on a country by country basis not very effectively. Is there any and, kind and the reason? Hmm? Pardon me? No, no, go ahead. Finish with your reason. I was going to say there's a reason that it's not effective. It's not that uh, the people in these organizations are inherently evil. It's that there are pressures on them, usually economic pressures. And um, I, I used to see this on the Pacific coast when there was a very large trawl fishery on the Pacific coast. And there was a fair sense that, that these species were being overfished. And uh, the, the council that was in charge of setting quotas, um, the scientists would give them input and say, you know what, um, you got to drop the quotas here. And uh, then they'd have an open uh, meeting and the trawlers would come in and say, you know what, if you lower the quotas, uh, my kids are going to have to live under a bridge and I'm going to go out of business. And it's just really hard for, for anybody unless you're like Mussolini to go like, hey, screw you guys. We're just gonna do what's best for the fish. It's hard, it's not impossible. And sometimes that happens, but historically uh, economic pressures of various sorts have won. And of course that's true for, <laughs> for everything else in the world. Economic pressures tend to win. There's been that's a the reason my son, is a, my son is a farmer Marxist is he, he disagrees with that. Former or farmer? He's a farmer. He's the, I think, the only Marxist farmer in the state that he lives in. So he farms Marxists? Do they you know just if he grow? could grow them successfully and sell them, he probably would. Fascinating. I should a ask him if there's a seed for Trotsky, but I don't know. That seems like that would be dangerous. He was pretty bloodthirsty. He was uh, not to hear, my, well, no. <laughs> I look, by the way, I looked like Trotsky in my, in graduate school. I had longer hair and it was all curly and I had a goatee and a mustache. I could have passed for Trotsky before he had the, uh, you know, the sharp implement in his skull, of course. Was there a Stalin in your class too? You know, in retrospect, my genetics professor uh, was fairly close to that. Oh no. Yeah. Uh, so... To go back to this idea of the oceans and economic pressures, I have two questions about that. Number one, yeah. there's been a push on Earth for lab-grown meat, and eventually they'll get to lab-grown fish. Do you have any sense of that relieving the pressure on the oceans? I guess it would depend on a price point. We're back to economics, right? So, you know, what are people willing to pay? And people who kind of fall on the concern for CO2 levels and factory farming and la la la. And if they have the money, they're probably willing to pay a fair amount, but like average people who can barely afford the rent, uh, I don't know. Can the government um, subsidize that? Because that seems like that's the standard model on Earth. The government subsidizes fossil fuels. The government subsidizes milk, cows. They just print money, right? And they just print money. Why can't they just print money for the artificial fish? Artificial so fish. I'd like you to be honest. Is one of you Bernie Sanders? Just be 
straightforward here. Up front, can we be transparent? Uh huh. That's what I thought. Well, the government can do to a certain extent whatever it wants, right? And if if that's viewed by the voting public as a really important thing, and they elect, you know, you, this is how this works. If enough people scream and yell and and threaten, then the government will go like, yeah, let's un, let's do that. But but in our current system. I would guess that a farmer in Wyoming, uh, a rancher, has far more political suasion than some goober in Silicon Valley who can grow, you know, meat at a, a fairly expensive level. I don't know. Now the question is, how much would you have to produce to to markedly decrease uh, fishing and uh, that's a really good question because if you produce, let's say, fish, faux fish, that's really good. Um, would you actually cut into the commercial fishing industry or would you just create more demand for faux fish? And um, I don't know. I don't know how that would that would work. Because humans You're right, fish. I mean, the, 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 why don't we take your argument to something you've mentioned before, which is uh, global warming? Well, in theory, there, if, if you pump enough money into solving global warming issues, at some point you'll start dropping, diminishing the amount of CO2 that's uh, excreted by us all, right? Take a lot of money. Well, it and seems a lot like of... the problems are larger than just CO2. It has to do with the particulate matter and the pollution. And, sure. You know, I've seen videos oh. of... Uh, you know, a drop of toothpaste falls on a bug and the bug dies instantly. These are things that are just running into the water and into the oceans. And it seems like those are enormous issues that people aren't really paying attention to because they're lost in this idea of CO2 as being the most important marker. But there's far, far more that's getting into the oceans that's crashing things than just the CO2. Yes, I'm still working on the fact that that bugs can't brush their teeth. Um, okay, so, sorry. I had no idea that that, that was a problem for bugs. Um, they're dirty, dirty little creatures. That's why humans don't like them. They, but not for, I mean, it's not their fault. They just can't apparently bathe. Um, if you create so, a market for cockroach toothbrushes, maybe maybe. So, you know it. what? There's a market for everything, kiddo. There is a market for everything. It, people are just... Holy <laughs> gaboo. Holy <laughs> flaming gaboo. You can, there, there are sites where you can get rocks and that you put in your nether regions. Holy moly. Come on. So any, in fact, just like regular rocks. Could, uh, I wonder if we could market bugs that you can put in your nether. Regions. <laughs> oh my God. That would... so I'm just throwing ideas out here. So, um, so the, the Kind of lost track of where we're where we're going, but um, okay, things in the ocean. So I just use um, CO two as a, a marker, an example, and and most we, people do. But it seems to me well, well, we, that that is a political issue on Earth because of what we talked about earlier in the conversation, where you start to look at these CO two readings and you see that scientists are extrapolating backwards in time taking ice cores, soil cores, and you see, just looking at the data, how noisy it gets going back in time. And they draw yeah. this straight line through the data, which shows that things are increasing in the present day. And people that are looking at the data who happen to disagree with the conclusions are easily able to say, well, look at these experts, they're just making things up. Yeah. But, but, if you were to focus on all of these other things, the sort of the wasteful and toxic nature of industrial production, it seems like far, far fewer people would have an issue with it. Like, the problem is you're destroying your planet, not whether it's getting warmer or not. Yeah, you'll destroy it's the planet like, before it's it It's like heats. the metric is so, moved. So here is, here is the uh, dystopian response. We're going through a pandemic, right? Yep. Saw that. Pretty close to cause and effect. People come down with a disease and a certain percentage, they die. They don't die a year later. 
They die a week later, cause and effect. Do you see everybody in the United States going like, holy screwballs, we got to put masks on? No. Here is a, 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 a black and white, back to that example, of, of cause and effect. And yet a, a significant number of people just go like, the hell with that. So what you're saying is, well, we're destroying the planet. We're dumping all this shit in the ocean and the atmosphere. Uh, but that's relatively slow. It's not the next week. And if we can't get people to wear masks because people are dying around them, how are we going to get people to agree to change their lives over something that may not happen for years or never? So, But that seems like an industrial level regulation. You know, I look at the way that humans buy things and the products that are sold and marketed to them, and it seems like the questions of this sort of protection have to happen on an industrial level. There shouldn't uh, be something in the store that's going to kill the ocean. Now, it turned out that you, there is a planet full of Marxists. Yeah, I mean, that is, what I'm saying is there are economic drivers to perpetuating what is going on. And... There have to be incentive structures available to promote the proper behavior, though. And it doesn't seem like there's incentive structures on Earth that promote proper behavior. It seems like the incentive structures on Earth promote defection from the whole. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's spotty. I mean, I say yes. I say yes, but, but there are cultures that are semi-exceptions to this rule and there are peoples that are semi-exceptions to this rule and and you can look at there are some south pacific cultures for instance that have um ended overfishing because um historically there have been territorial rights to coral reefs and who who controls what and who takes what resources so you can find examples of people who are not completely selfish which is what we're really addressing here how do you get people to be less selfish when that act is perceived as painful well on our planet it helped a lot for the scientists to really bring it home to people that nobody exists in a vacuum so on your planet for instance you might think of yourself as separate from that tree outside your window but you couldn't breathe without it and if you can't breathe, you don't exist. So perhaps there's a role for science in incentivizing. Well, and, and that is being done. I mean, there's no question that to a certain extent, even through the media, um, science is, is um, getting its word out. The, the, the question is, is there any science that is... Um, per, that is given out in any way that will overcome the the inertia of um, I'm comfortable the way I am. These people are telling me bad things are happening, but I really don't see it. I really don't want to give up driving a Hummer. I really, really don't want to drive up, give up driving a Hummer. Uh, uh, I really don't want to stop using plastics just because they want in the ocean. I really, I really don't. I don't know what it takes. I don't know if humans can achieve the level of sophistication en masse that will uh, uh, give us the space to do that. I don't know. I would suggest that humans don't necessarily need to do that if these things are regulated the same way that you know, nuclear waste is regulated. You can't just dump... Nuclear waste is... I, I, with all due respect, uh, nuclear waste is barely regulated. It's Perhaps that's been, a bad example. Well, I mean, but... but Thank you for Firearms. the opening. Uh, where is most nuclear waste, high-level nuclear waste? It's sitting in big water vats next to the power plants. The, the, the idea that, yeah, we're going to bury it under Yucca Mountain in Nevada... Uh, great until you the people of Nevada like freak out. So that's kind of the point. Or fine, thalidomide. 
Now, thalidomide is, is kind of grotesquely speaking, the optimistic side of the argument that the, that the downsides of thalidomide were so intense and so apparent and so frightening that uh, there was a, a, a universal um, decision made to, to do away with that. But, but I think the problem that we're talking about it, it, it doesn't rise to the level of uh, deformed uh, babies. And you think that it never will? Because it seems like when the entire ecological platform of the planet starts dying, a la DDT, there's going to be something to point to that's visible. Why did DDT well, the, get banned? Well, it's not so, banned everywhere, right? That's true. It, it is not banned everywhere. It was banned, I posit, during a period in American political history where you could get away with that. Now, if DDT had been in use until now, there's no way, obviously, there's no way it could be banned now. So um, it, it was almost a unique period uh, that the, the banning um, took place. The, why, why do you, you think say it that? Couldn't, yeah, why do you think it couldn't get banned now? Because there's no political will now. So the answer is that to find political will. Well, ultimately, of course, th th that is one of the, the keystones of, of any social movement or any social change or any uh, policy change is, is politics. As long as we have a, in our country, I'm only speaking in the United States, I'm not speaking for other countries, as long as we have a system that kind of reflects the will of the people, kind of, sort of, then um, yeah, political is one mechanism. I mean, th then the question is, well, how, how, do, how do you get the political uh, gears rolling? And of course, the, what we're taught in school is, uh, uh, well, you uh, vote for X, Y, and Z and, and so forth. And that is one way. And then there's mass action for better or worse. That's another way. And um, the, 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 the problem I think is that yes, we will start seeing the effects or we are seeing the effects of uh, environmental damage on large scales and we are seeing the effects, but they can still be explained away or they don't, in, they don't uh, affect everyone. Okay, if, if hurricanes are getting larger in the, in the Atlantic and in the Caribbean because water is, is getting warmer, um, you know, they only occur two or three times, massive ones, uh, two or three times a year, and they just affect a few, relatively few people, and it could be from something else. Uh, how do we know? How do we know? So the, the pain of thalidomide is, is not uh, that intense with, with some of these um, uh, things that are starting to occur more and more. The, I guess that's it. Now that I've, now that I've wasted about 20 minutes of your time, that it, it, it comes down to pain. And pain before, my fear is... How many people be, have pain, right? Well, it, it comes down, yes, how many people are in pain? And, and can you link that pain to events? And by the time the pain is sufficiently widespread that people go like, yeah, well, we've really screwed up. It's going to be quite a ways down the road, I think. But if there's something that your work has shown is that even quite a few ways down the road, if the pressures are lifted, it seems like animal populations will recover. Have you been to Mount St. Helens? Or, or organism populations, uh, not just animals, but I mean, I think that's been shown in, in many places. Um, yeah, it, all things being equal, and that's, that's the, the key, populations do tend to recover once the stressor or stressors are gone. The, the issue is that um, uh, in certain cases, the stressors aren't gonna go away. And, 
and for a long time. And uh, e even if uh, CO2 emissions uh, go down, the Arctic is still gonna warm up for a long time to come. Stressors are less, but polar bears are still gonna be like unhappy. Of for course. A long time. Mm. And so to close this multipolar conversation, <laughs> what does a robust relationship between humans and the oceans look like? Oh, uh, mutual respect. Um, and, uh, w w w but, but that's true for terrestrial systems, it's true for everything is uh, uh, mutual respect. And, and one of the ways that can be done, if I can uh, get on my soapbox, though I've been on it this whole time, uh, is that the hardest thing, one of the hardest things for humans to do is to be moderate in their behavior. That's just, I don't think that's built into us. It has to be learned. And to be moderate in everything, to be moderate to each other, and to be moderate to the planet, and to be moderate in our behaviors and in our use of, of natural resources. And that's not happening. There is no moderation from, on, from society as a whole. So um, mutual respect in this particular case would come about through a, at least an attempt at moderation, if not the fulfillment of that, uh, of that end point. I love that. I do too. So perhaps we can stop here, but we could probably talk to you all day. Maybe we can do this again sometime. I have no life. So I'm just sitting here with my hands folded, waiting for aliens to talk to me. So yeah, anytime. We'll call you again soon, Dr. Love. Thank you. Sure. You know, call me Milton. Only, only my wife calls me Dr. Love. All right, Milton. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.